Hello everyone. I've been asked to prepare a short presentation for the Meet the Professors sessions this week. What I'm going to do is, is talk a little bit about who I am, um, the journey that I've had to becoming a professor at UWE, things that I find interesting and exciting about undertaking research here at UWE, uh, the most exciting project that um, from my perspective anyway that we've been involved with and how I see the research field developing over the next few years. So who am I? Well, I'm Mel Smith. I'm Professor of Machine Vision and together with Lyndon, uh, I'm Director of the Centre for Machine Vision, which is now based in the Bristol Robotics Laboratory in T-Block. So it, it probably makes sense to just quickly give a little bit of history about the Centre for Machine Vision itself. We actually formed um, what we originally called the Machine Vision Laboratory quite a while ago now, back in 2000. And we were originally based over the road from UWE in the Bristol Business Park. We applied for um, centre status uh, in 2004, which I think is a good thing to do um, for any group to work towards centre status gives some um, sort of recognition of the group um, and a few other advantages. And then in um, 2011, we changed the name of the, um, the lab to the Centre for Machine Vision. Uh, and then in, in 2014, we uh, joined with the Bristol Robotics Laboratory where we are now. So my journey to becoming a professor has been quite an unusual one, perhaps. Really going back as far as um, the contact I had with my grandfather, he was um, quite quite a character. He repaired clocks and built radio sets. And there he is dealing with one of those newfangled Austin A35s. Um, and that sort of interest that he had, I think, rubbed off on me in a way. So I always enjoyed making things at school and then later on. I remember when I was young, I had a particular interest in automation and spent quite a lot of time making arcade machines, sort of fruit machines, that kind of thing. Because, of course, this was before the days of PCs or any sort of affordable computing. They didn't really exist back in the late 60s and 70s, and really throughout the 80s. So we just did the best with what we had. So my first computer was a Sinclair ZX81, which got a lot of use from. Um, and then later on, was able to get access to a BBC Micro and Pet Commodore. So back in those days, we were using Fortran and BASIC. But throughout all of this, I've always enjoyed repairing and renovating things and still do now. So I've always been a, a practical sort of person. So back to the, uh, the career. When I left school, I went to work for a local engineering company called Benson's International Systems near Stroud and served a four year apprenticeship with that company. And I do value that. I'm not sure if it really goes on these days in quite the way it did then. I suppose it must do. Um, so we learned all sorts of trades, really, milling, turning, welding, as I've said there. And there we were at um, a competition that was held in 1979 at Bristol University for technicians, which was, which was quite a thing, quite an event. That's me in the middle, by the way. So the apprenticeship that I served was as a toolmaker. Um, and what is that? Well, it's not it's not uh, making tools such such as you might use in, in a domestic setting, like uh, garden tools and workshop tools, that sort of thing. It's making these these things. So these are called progression tools. They're highly precisely made bits of equipment that um, that are used for manufacturing the sort of tools you might experience in everyday life. So how does that work? Well, that um, 
the way these things work is that metal, sheet metal, is passed through this tool, which is mounted in a press. Um, the tool cycles up and down, and the sheet metal gradually moves forward. And as it does so, it's worked on. So um, there's, there's this operation called raising, which involves shaping the material gradually as it progresses through the tool, and then blanking, which is punching sections out and eventually shearing, shearing the metal off. So these, these tools are used to produce thousands or hundreds of thousands of components very quickly in very large machines. And what um, tool makers do is make this precision piece of equipment. It's a very expensive item um, and made very accurately. So, you know, to uh, thousands of an inch and better. So while I was working for that company, I eventually moved on from the uh, tool room to become what they called a project engineer, which involved working in the drawing office, uh, designing these tools and various bits of automated equipment that were uh, used to assemble the parts that the tools made. That's really what Benson's did. So that's me in the drawing office. So what sort of things could be made like this? Well, bottom left shows an example of a, an assembly, assembled mechanism made in this kind of way. So this is a, uh, what's called a ring binder mechanism. It's, it's used in files to hold sheets of loose leaf paper together. I'm sure you've seen this kind of thing. The top middle is, is a machine that would be used manually to do that. So that's a press with a bowl feeder feeding various component parts in and what would happen a person would sit in front of that all day long assembling uh, the various parts of this this mechanism so a very labor intensive process so what my work involved as a project engineer was designing automated systems to do that automatically and this is an example here so these were controlled by things called PLCs programmable logic controllers and they use a, a kind of programming language called relay ladder logic um, and you can see it's uh, quite a complicated device and we produce many of these machines and I worked there for quite a long time I was there for nine years in all including the apprenticeship and throughout that time I was attending the local technical college as it, as it was called in those days on day release uh, working towards these thing called a higher technician certificate I also joined the IMEC -E around that time. The, the bottom left shows an example of these mechanisms, they, the loose leaf mechanisms for the ring binder mechanisms that I mentioned earlier. They came in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And incredible, incredibly, um, that one company in Stroud where these were made, made three million of these mechanisms every single week. It's remarkable really where they all went. So the next step in my career was going to university. Benson's were very good. They sponsored me through a four-year thick sandwich course at the University of Bath and I was also lucky enough to win a BP scholarship for that, that kind of course. Um, and that, that involved spending a term at university and then going back to the company um, working towards chartered engineer status that was really the idea of that. So it was on and off at the university and, um, uh, and back to the company. So there I am now at the University of Bath in 1983. Uh, that's me there experimenting with hair. So eventually I left Benson's and then I went to what was then called the Cranfield Institute of Technology for a year to study an MSc in robotics and automation, which was really starting to take off around that time. Following that, I went to work at the University of Bristol and registered for a PhD there. And it was following that that I moved to what was Bristol Poly in 1989, I think it was, where I was employed as a lecturer. Um, and then that's where my UE career really began. So in 95, I became a senior lecturer and then a reader in 2004 and then a professor in 2008. 
So I suppose this is really where my academic career got started. I got interested in machine vision a little bit at Cranfield, but then much more at Bristol University. And I was able to pick this up when I came to UWE and get more involved in research in the way that I wanted to. I've always liked machine vision as an area to work in because it can be very applied, things like industrial inspection, surface quality control, or it can be very theoretical, which is related to image understanding. How do we see and make sense of the world around us? And I think it's been a good time to work in this area because of the explosion in deep learning very recently, but prior to that developments in computing capabilities and in lighting. So where things started getting really interesting for me was around 1990 when I had this idea that you could use a simple law governing the way light reflects from a surface to recover the three-dimensional nature of the underlying surface. So it's based on, on something known as Lambert's law which has been around for a long time. I think Lambert existed in the 17th century and I realized that using this, I'll show you what I mean in the next few slides, it would be possible to recover a 3D surface. So this shows the basic idea that if you illuminate a surface that has three dimensional relief from different directions, then the way the surface appears changes. I'm not talking really about the shadows here that are visible in that image, but the way the brightness of the surface varies depending upon the orientation of the surface and its relationship to the light source. So this is really based on quite a simple idea. This is all that Lambert's law is really saying. If we have a light source in a known position with a given brightness and we measure the intensity of light at this point here, then we can find this angle. That's really all that's going on. And then by doing that again and again at different locations across the surface, we can recover all these surface normals in a dense array of surface normals. And once we have all these normals here, we can use a process of numerical integration to recover the, the three-dimensional relief or the depth of the surface. That's the basic idea. And I thought, wow, you know, that, that's quite clever. We can recover 3D data from 2D images. So in theory, you could take some old bit of film, and as long as the lighting was right, and you had enough data, you could recover the surface relief. The problem was, though, I later discovered that two people or two key players had really already discovered this or invented this technique slightly earlier. So that took the wind out of the sails. I thought I'd invented photometric stereo. But even so, it had really sat dormant for a long time, not really very much going on. There were very few papers published in these early days. It was almost a laboratory curiosity, really. So I was able to build upon this work and add the idea of these normals being a texture that, that you could unwrap from the surface. So this sort of shows the idea here. You've got the, the original acquired images up here, and this is what you're trying to find, the nature of a surface, an unknown surface that has both shape and color. And using this photometric stereo technique, what you can do is recover the intensity information from the surface, the, the brightness or the albedo, the way the light bounces back from the surface in terms of its intensity, and also the three-dimensional surface relief, which you could think of as a kind of texture on the surface. And that led to some interesting potential applications. And this is one where an original image can be separated into the color shown as a gray level image here, a black and white image, and the shape. So this is a non-slip swimming pool tile. And I tried to get some companies interested in this idea, one of which was in Bristol, of using this in an inspection task. So we could, we could look in this image for um, geometric errors in a molding process, say in the manufacture of this tile, and for printing errors up here. 
you could kind of think of this whole process as being able to unwrap the two-dimensional information and separate it from the three-dimensional information of a surface. And in a quality control application, you could then inspect both separately. And that was of interest in a number of different applications. And that's really where my research work at UE got started, how, thinking about how we could use this technique in a useful way. So moving on then, thinking about what, what's exciting about all this. Well, I think the possibility of doing something new is always exciting. But as I've shown, at least in my case, it's very difficult to do something that's truly new. It's more often the case of moving things forward, bringing together ideas and moving things forward. I think that's where a lot of research actually is. And then being able to make a difference. And I suppose that relates to impact, doing something that's useful, that you can work with companies and they, they exploit it in some way. I think that can be quite rewarding. In all of this, I think there's always this danger of being overtaken, overtaken by events. So Sometimes it's a good idea to try and move quickly, at least in my view, because others will be having similar ideas. You will be publishing. Others will see the publication and be sort of motivated to move in your area. So that's that's always a factor that's in my mind. So in order to be able to pursue interests like this, there are a few things that you need to be able to do. One is attract funding, and that's always a challenge. We've got all these various bodies that we all keep applying to. And I think persistence there, trying to, trying to learn from feedback and you know, modify what you're doing in the light of what you learn is, is the way to go. Also, I would say it's quite important to try and find a niche, something that other people are, are already doing that isn't already well explored. And then by developing a reputation, I think that can enable you to link with, with others. So working with industry, working with the KTNs, the knowledge transfer networks, and so on. That can be a way of, of doing those kinds of things. So one of the first projects where we were able to start developing a bit of a profile, a bit of a reputation in the community was a series of projects, actually, we had with an American-based company called Quantronics. What we did for them is build a series of demonstrator systems, prototypes, if you like, that were able to capture three-dimensional data from objects placed underneath and then fit fit the smallest cuboid around whatever the uh, size of that object was. So this was used for sending objects through the postal service. So the cost of sending an object is related to its principal dimensions. And what the system did is, is capture the principal dimensions of an object. And we used a technique called laser triangulation to do that. We've actually had a whole series of projects using different techniques in machine vision, often working with commercial partners. What I want to do today is just look a little bit more at projects where we've used this photometric stereo technique, one of which is in a series of projects we had working for the MOD in various ways to detect hidden objects. So I mentioned earlier on that um, photometric stereo can be used to separate surface colouring from surface shape. And so that has applications in in this sort of situation where things are hidden or camouflaged in some way. So we we had a project to build a demonstrator to do this. Here's another example. And we've since gone on to explore the use of photometric stereo in a number of different applications, ranging from skin cancer to biometrics. And this was some work we had with Imperial College in the late Maria Petru to develop technology for facial recognition that resulted in a number of PhDs and quite a lot of publicity. Quite an interesting area of work, I think. More recently, the work of the centre has moved into agriculture, developing technology in farming. This is a good time to be working in this area. There are opportunities to make a difference. It's considerably less well developed than traditional manufacturing techniques. So this is a current ongoing project in the lab using machine vision and deep learning to identify and recognize weeds, in this case, in pasture and grass. The idea is to reduce the amount of um, herbicide that's used, thereby uh, minimizing environmental pollution. Other work in farming concerns the monitoring of livestock, 
this has been quite a successful project, I think, looking at uh, dairy cattle to use um, three dimensional vision to estimate weight, their body condition, which is basically how fat the animal is and detect lameness. And this has been funded by a few projects we've had in the lab. That's a, most recently a very successful KTP that um, is moving this towards a commercial application. And the system is now on a number of farms throughout the UK. So quite rewarding to see that kind of impact going on. So you can see the technology in operation here, how it captures a 3D image from cattle moving beneath. That information is then analysed uh, and interpreted to uh, estimate uh, the shape of the animal and link that to its, its condition. Other work in the lab has been concerned with um, root crops, monitoring them as they're harvested, looking at distribution of um, size, and then moving on to uh, what I think is the most interesting project that we've been involved with, which brings together a number of elements of prior work and develops a bit of a niche area for us. I think at the moment, UE is really ahead of the game working in this, and that's of face recognition in animals. We started off working in humans. A lot of other people are doing that. There's much less going on in the animal world. So the work we're doing is to do with recognizing the individual and more recently uh, looking at expression in animals and linking that to their mood and their well-being. I think this is a really exciting area of work and I'd like the lab to be able to capitalize on what we've done uh, and, and attract some new funding and keep ahead of the game. It's got quite potentially large opportunity for impact in that we can improve uh, precision farming um, by identifying individual animals, perhaps know something about how they, they're getting on, um, their mood, um, look at their condition, and use that to um, improve animal welfare. So how do I see the, the field developing over the next few years? Well, it's very clear that um, the introduction of AI, machine learning and deep learning has had a huge impact. It's really changed um, the way a lot of machine vision tasks are done. Not everything, some is, some things have stayed the same. Uh, things that um, use conventional classical techniques to do with finding edges and sort of measuring the position of things, that hasn't changed. But recognizing objects in unstructured environments, tasks where the, um, the solution can be data-driven, it's having a huge impact there and opening up, opening up all sorts of new possibilities, making things that were either difficult or impossible to do in the past, now quite achievable. So I, again, an exciting time, I think, to be working in machine vision, um, with this link with um, artificial intelligence and all sorts of new applications, one of which is in agritech. And then finally, just to uh, finish off, one thing I wanted to say is that all of these things are only made possible by the people that we're able to attract and employ and be part of the team and hang on to. Um, having grants and facilities, that's great, but if you don't have good people and a happy team, I think, then um, none of this is possible. Well, that's about it for me. Uh, thanks for listening. I hope you found that interesting. If you um, have any interest in what we do in the lab or want to explore working with us, then um, please don't hesitate to, uh, to get in touch. Bye.